just just one or two more minutes to start. Hmm. There's still people joining. Yeah. Now it's on your dot too. Hello, everyone. Um, there are still some people joining, but um, we'll let a, a few more join as I give an introduction to this seminar. This is Denise Kabosta at University College Cork in Ireland. Um, I'm really delighted to welcome you on behalf of the organizing committee to this latest in a series of seminars sponsored by the European VLBI network, focusing on high resolution radio astronomy. I want first to mention just a few logistics of the webinar before we begin. You will all be muted throughout the presentation, but you are invited to type in any questions you may have for our speaker through the question and answer facility. You can send in questions both during and after the presentation, but questions will be answered only after the presentation is finished. Please try to write your questions clearly and keep them short. We'll aim to get to as many of your questions as we can, and we apologize in advance if your question is not among those we have time to answer. I'd now like to introduce today's speaker, Marcello Giroletti of the INAF Instituto di Radio Astronomia in Bologna, where he's been a member of the research staff since 2008. Marcello's research interests focus on studying active galactic nuclei and other astrophysical sources using both very long baseline interferometry and high energy instruments. He has been a member of various research collaborations over the years, including the Fermi LAT collaboration and the CTA consortium. Today, Marcello will be telling us about resolving multi messenger puzzles with very long baseline interferometry. And I'll hand over to Marcello. Thank you, Denise, for the introduction. Welcome everyone. Resolving multi-messenger puzzles with very long baseline interferometry. Does this title even make sense? Let me give you a few numbers. Consider a typical neutrino event and its credible region of uh, origin and take the size of uh, a VLBI field of view. It would take 300,000 VLBI field of views to image this region. Things get worse uh, if we consider gravitational wave events. Let's take a typical event, and we can say that it would take 140 million fields to image the entire region. And please don't get me started about cosmic rays, which can literally come from anywhere in the sky. So is there any, any hope, any chance to do some useful searches with VLBI for multi-messenger events? Yes, there is. Uh, we need to take a step back 
and face things from the beginning. So a few words about multi-messenger astronomy. Multi-messenger astronomy is basically the observations of the universe using carriers of information that are other than the usual electromagnetic waves and photons that we uh, use for the study of the universe. There are three main such carriers, cosmic rays, neutrinos, and gravitational waves. Well, cosmic rays have been known for more than a century, so they are relatively easy to detect, but they have a big problem. They are charged particles, and so they are deflected by magnetic fields, and so it's really impossible to tell where they originate, or at least to locate the origin of an individual cosmic ray. Neutrinos don't have this problem. Neutrinos are neutral, as the name indicates, but the problem with them is that they are very weakly interacting particles, so they are really hard to detect. In fact, except for the Sun, the only um, non-solar system source of neutrinos was supernova 1997A um, in the local universe, uh, and no other extragalactic sources of astrophysical neutrinos were, were known until the last decade when Ice Cube entered in operation. And finally, we have gravitational waves. Gravitational waves uh, have been also around for over a century, at least in theory, but in practice, uh, they were not detected uh, by any instrument until 2015. So this is a um, really recent uh, um, area of development uh, for astrophysical research, and uh, it offers a lot of opportunities, uh, but also significant challenges. I think the main opportunity is certainly that uh, it's not based on photons, and as such, it gives access to dark sources. And by dark, I mean uh, dark matter, dark energy, uh, black holes, and so these are all um, elements that can provide important uh, clues about uh, issues in fundamental physics, uh, in cosmology, in general relativity, and so on. Um, for neutrinos in particular, they allow to have access uh, to information about regions uh, where very extreme energies are reached, and I'm talking about uh, uh, over the PV range. And of course, this cannot be achieved uh, on any um, laboratory on Earth, but even uh, in electromagnetic waves, it's really hard to have information at such high energies. From the instrumental point of view, uh, again, we have um, opportunities and challenges. Uh, we cannot focus uh, um, multi-messenger carriers, so in practice, the detectors have very large field of views. They can uh, receive a signal from uh, anywhere in the sky, but uh, this comes with uh, um, the price of uh, a very poor angular resolution. Mm, this is not uh, uh, a new challenge for astronomers. Astronomers have had uh, detectors with wide field for a long time. This is certainly the case for high energy satellites uh, like Fermi, but also for transit instruments at low frequency. And I think CHIME is a, a very significant case in which uh, uh, we can appreciate uh, how important it is to have an instrument with a wide field of view that detects a lot of sources, in this case, fast radio bursts, but also to have the cooperation of follow-up instruments with higher angular resolution that can really provide the information on the localization of the sources and their physical properties. And in this context, uh, I would like to spend uh, um, a couple of slides uh, on the Fermi uh, Gamma Ray Space Telescope, because it really provides uh, a very important link between the multi-messenger domain and the high angular resolution domain uh, that is the subject uh, of this talk uh, um, through the VLBI technique. So the Gamma Ray Space, uh, the Fermi Gamma Ray Space uh, Telescope was launched in 2008, and it carries on board two instruments. One is the Large Area Telescope, which observes about 20% of the sky at any instant in the 10 to 100 GV energy range, roughly. The fact that it has such a wide field of view and that it uh, uh, orbits the Earth, uh, uh, taking about uh, 90 minutes to make uh, a full uh, revolution, means that uh, it can really provide an unbiased view, uh, homogeneous view of the of the sky uh, with a very regular cadence. And this has allowed uh, to detect uh, sources uh, belonging to many classes. AGNs primarily, in particular blazers, but also pulsars, supernova remnants, uh, gamma ray bursts, and more. The other instrument on board Fermi is the gamma ray burst monitor, GBM in short. And this, is, this has an even larger field of view. It basically sees the entire sky except the part that is blocked by the Earth. But again, by going around the Earth in 90 minutes, it can really provide a continuous monitoring of the sky. 
the energy range is kind of lower, the sensitivity is also lower, so it is uh, ideally suited for gamma ray burst studies uh, and uh, um, other astrophysical sources do not contribute significantly to emission in the GBM domain. In the right hand side here, you see a view of the gamma ray sky as seen from the LAT and a couple of numbers that I think can be uh, relevant um, to understand how high angular resolution observations are important in bridging the information provided by high energy observatories and uh, the real uh, physics going on on detailed uh, fine scales. So in the 4FGL, the fourth uh, um, catalog of LAT objects, only 1.5% of the sources show a sign of extension. And in particular, in the extragalactic sky, 99.9% .9 of the sources are point-like. So it's clear that if we want to know more about uh, the structure of these uh, sources of high energy, we need uh, better angular resolution. And I have two sample cases uh, that I would like to show to you in which uh, VLBI ideally um, supported the high energy observations and also finally bridged the gap from a multi-wavelength approach to a multi-messenger approach. On the left-hand side, you see uh, a gamma ray inset and a movie of VLBI observations done after the um, discovery of Nova B47 Cygni in 2010. This was a, a big surprise because Nova were not expected to be bright gamma ray sources. And when this one was observed, um, the conclusion was immediately that very energetic processes uh, had to take place in this system. And so a follow-up campaign with the EVN for over six months was really able to um, demonstrate the evolution of the radio emission, the non-thermal radio emission produced by um, the particles accelerated in the gamma ray production, in, in, the, in the processes that uh, resulted in the gamma ray production. On the right-hand side, we have a blazer. It's TXS of 506 plus 056. It is a very, nowadays, very uh, famous source in which, again, we can see the power of the combination of uh, monitoring instruments in uh, uh, gamma rays and in neutrinos. This is a, a Fermi and ice cube uh, um, detection that is also supported by pointed observations, in particular by magic at very high energy and with VLBI in several epochs um, after the detection of the neutrino and the associated gamma ray flare. I'm not going to say more about this, uh, this object, uh, except that uh, it really highlights uh, the synergy between uh, multi-messenger detection with the neutrino, high energy observations with Fermi and, very, and, and magic, and high angular resolution observations with VLBI. Um, but I'm not going to say more about this because we already had um, a seminar in this series by Yuri Kovalev, so I encourage you, if you want to know more about the neutrino uh, blazer connection to check the recording of that. Uh, of that uh, mm, seminar. Anyway, I think we have finally now made the connection between uh, high angular resolution observation, high energy observations, and multi-messenger triggers. And now leaving aside neutrinos, I would like to focus on gravitational wave detectors. And uh, to say very few words about gravitational waves, we can uh, um, keep in mind that they are uh, ripples in space-time that travel across the universe at the speed of light. And once they reach uh, uh, very far distances, as those that separate Earth from the sources of gravitational waves, in particular from compact object mergers, they produce tiny uh, changes in the space, uh, and uh, these need to be detected with very sensitive instruments. Uh, um, the current um, approach is to use uh, interferometers, uh, not uh, um, radio interferometers. Uh, so um, these are basically microsone interferometers uh, with uh, um, updated characteristics uh, uh, that are really necessary to detect uh, the tiny changes in the length of the, um, of the arms of the interferometer to detect uh, um, the gravitational wave front. In practice, this is done at the moment with two interferometers in the US that form Advanced LIGO and one interferometer in Italy that is called Advanced Virgo. Uh, the combination of these uh, three instruments is uh, used to improve the um, understanding of the properties of the source of emission. And this is uh, somewhat similar to what we do in VLBI. We combine information obtained from different positions on the Earth with the long baselines to improve our Mm, understanding of the our resolution, basically. 
Of course, in the case of gravitational waves, uh, the angular resolution that is achieved is nowhere near what we can do with the LBI. And in fact, uh, I put here accuracy in quotes because uh, the uncertainty region, uh, as I mentioned uh, also on my first slide, can be very large, hundreds or even thousands of square degrees. In terms of the distance of the sources that we can observe, we're talking tens to hundreds or perhaps, perhaps uh, a few thousand uh, megaparsec mm, for the brightest events. A few, um, a few more words uh, about the type of sources uh, that uh, produce gravitational waves that the current inter interferometer can detect. Uh, there are basically um, they are basically dominated by mergers of compact objects. Uh, black hole black hole mergers are those that can be more massive and therefore produce a stronger signal that can be detected for sources at a more distant horizon. The problem in this case is that these systems are expected to be very clean system with little gas to accrete and therefore little electromagnetic uh, um, emission to be produced. The case is different for neutron star and star mergers. In this case, the progenitors are lighter and therefore we cannot expect to detect them out to very large distances. But on the other hand, we have um, the expectation to detect electromagnetic radiation in particular in the form of short gamma ray burst. And this will be the topic of most of the uh, remaining of this talk. And finally, there is this intermediate class where the two merging objects are one neutron star and one black hole. This is intermediate in terms of mass and of uh, um, horizon. Uh, although it's really unclear at the moment whether an electromagnetic counterpart uh, would be um, detectable. To set a few milestones uh, in the um, development of uh, gravitational wave astrophysics, uh, I think there are uh, three dates, um, 2015, September 14, 2017, October 14, and October 17. The first of these dates uh, is the first detection of gravitational waves with uh, uh, LIGO. This was an event that was really historical. Uh, it witnessed the merging of uh, two black holes with masses in the uh, 30 to 40 solar mass range at a distance between uh, uh, 200 and 500 megaparsecs. The, the next uh, event that uh, I, I put in this list is 170814. And this was the first detection of gravitational waves, waves combining LIGO and Virgo. This is not a very different event in comparison to the, the previous one, but it really um, proved, proved, uh, proved that uh, it's uh, um, possible to combine signal from the, the two sets of interferometers uh, uh, across the Earth. And just a few days later, um, there was the historical detection of the first uh, binary neutral star merger. And even more importantly, there was the associated detection of uh, gamma rays from the Fermi GBM. Uh, the separation between the detection of this weak short gamma ray bars from the GBM and integral and the um, wavefront received by uh, LIGO Virgo was less than two seconds. And so the association was uh, um, definitely uh, concluded. And this really opened uh, a number of uh, uh, questions and uh, uh, a research that I'm going to tell you in the next slides. I just like to notice how just uh, a month later there was the detection of the 1709-22 neutrino. So those was, were really um, a golden year or a golden couple of months for multi-messenger uh, astronomy. But before going into more details on this particular event, I need to spend at least one slide to give you some background on gamma ray bursts. So gamma ray bursts are uh, very powerful uh, um, flashes of uh, emission detected in uh, um, soft gamma rays or hard X-rays. They are divided into classes, primarily uh, the long and the short gamma ray bursts. Uh, um, and this separation is based on the duration of the prompt phase. So the prompt phase is the immediate detection of uh, gamma rays from uh, this, uh, this event. Again, we have this uh, combination of uh, instrumental sets uh, and this detection is usually done with the very wide field uh, um, monitors, uh, such as uh, um, BAT on board SWIFT or the GBM on, on board Fermi. And based on the duration of this uh, prompt phase, we classify gamma ray bursts uh, as long or short uh, bursts. And this uh, dichotomy is not just uh, observational, but it is uh, associated to the origin of the, of the burst itself. 
in the case of long gamma ray bursts, there is evidence, direct evidence, that these are produced by the core collapse of massive stars. And this direct evidence is based on the fact that uh, supernovae have been um, discovered in several cases associated to the gamma ray burst. These are typically more luminous and are seen out to cosmological distances. And this is certainly one of the reasons why gamma ray bursts are interesting. And that's because they really allow us to probe uh, the most remote uh, regions in the universe. Short gamma ray bursts are less luminous. And uh, uh, there, is, there was still, before this uh, um, gravitational wave event, no conclusive evidence that they were produced by the merger of uh, neutron stars. Although there were a lot of indications in this sense based on the characteristics of the, of the host galaxy and also the lack of a supernova progenitor and the nature of the afterglow. Uh, what is the afterglow? The afterglow emission is a mission that takes place after the prompt emission and while the prompt emission lasts seconds or uh, at most a few minutes, the afterglow can last for days, uh, weeks or even months at the lowest energies. The afterglow emission in this complementary approach is uh, uh, typically studied with high resolution instruments in the X-rays, the optical and the radio. And this is very important because with the enhanced angular resolution, one can obtain localization and identification and therefore a distance and so constraints on the luminosities, on the host galaxy and, and so on. All the important uh, physical um, pieces of evidence that allow for an interpretation of the, of the event. In the case of uh, the LBI observations in particular, with the highest angular resolution, it's important to, um, they're useful, they're extremely useful to study the jet physical parameters and also the um, density profile of the circumbarst medium in which the, the jet uh, advances. And now going back to the multi-messenger event, 1708-17, um, we can give some characteristics of this event, in particular, um, the combined information from the three interferometers and the gamma ray um, burst monitor localization really narrowed it down to just 28 square degrees. Now, this uh, is still very large by the LBI standards, but is certainly mm, much better than in the case of hundreds or thousands of square degrees typical for other instruments. The other important information that gravitational wave detectors provide is the distance of the, mm, the at, least, at least the range of distances for the, mm, the merger. And in this case, it was as low as 40 plus or minus eight megaparsec. Again, this is low, this is low because uh, um, it's a neutron star, neutron star merger, and therefore it produces a, 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 a low signal that could have not been detected at uh, larger distances. So with this relatively small um, search region, it was possible to look for uh, electromagnetic radiation and optical emission was discovered 11 hours later and is shown very clearly in this, uh, in this inset here, a comparison of an archival image and uh, an image on August 17 that shows this compact bright uh, feature about uh, uh, two kiloparsecs uh, from the center of NGC 4993 galaxy. And uh, uh, this is an S0 type galaxy that is located at about 42 megaparsecs, so perfectly in the range of uh, um, expectations provided by the GW detection. So uh, after this location was identified, uh, follow-up observations also in X-rays and in radio uh, targeted this, uh, this object, but differently from what is typically observed in afterglows where X-ray emission in particular is detected very early. In this case, it came very late. It took nine days before Chandra was able to detect a rather faint uh, uh, emission from this, uh, from this afterglow. And this uh, started to put some um, questions on the nature of this, of this object. The radio came even later. It took 16 days before VLA and ATCA observations could reveal a first uh, detection of the radio emission from uh, this uh, uh, afterglow. So there were clearly some important answers provided by this event, but also important questions that were raised. The answers were basically that uh, 
short gamma ray bursts are indeed produced by mm, binary neutron star mergers. And this was the direct proof that was missing for short gamma ray bursts uh, as opposed to long gamma ray bursts, uh, in which case the identification was uh, uh, established for uh, two decades. The other very um, nice result was the detection in the optical and infrared of the kilonova. So basically the emission powered by radioactive decay of the elements produced in the binary neutron star merger. So these were uh, two fundamental uh, results, but uh, among the questions, uh, there was the reason why this afterglow was so unusual in the X-rays and in the radio, and whether this has anything to do with the formation and the structure of a jet formed after the merger of the two neutron stars. And uh, it's not easy to give an answer about uh, the nature of this, uh, of this event. Uh, a lot of observing time was invested uh, with different instruments. And I'm going to tell you the story starting from the large scale and the early observations that were carried, with, carried out with the VLA, ATCA, and GMRT. So before we get the really high angular resolution view, uh, we can approach it with the, the study of the light curve. So at the beginning, you see the dependence here on time and uh, frequency. There is a, um, a rather neat uh, behavior uh, in the light curve and in the spectrum with a slow, gentle rise of the gigahertz frequency emission and an optically thin uh, signature. This was quite uh, a surprise because it's difficult to reconcile with uh, uh, a well-developed jet. A well-developed jet, even if seen off axis, should produce a much sharper rise of the radio light curve. And the spectrum should also not be so uh, optically thin, but should show some turnover at low frequency. So this uh, uh, was really hard to reconcile, at least initially, with the development of a relativistic jet. And the picture with uh, where a choked jet uh, would transfer um, energy to a hot cocoon, and this uh, cocoon would produce the radio emission, was, uh, was preferred. However, as I said, this was not the end of the story because later there was a sudden decrease of the radio emission. And so the modeling based on the light curve uh, faced some problems and the possibility that a jet was actually present in the, in the source uh, basically remained open. And the only way to tell uh, whether the radio emission was produced by a hot cocoon or a fully relativistic jet uh, was to observe it with the high angular resolution. And so that's where the LBI comes into, uh, into play. And uh, uh, it did so by using its uh, full power. Um, let me point out here that this uh, event uh, occurred at a declination minus 23 degrees, which is again a challenge and an opportunity. It is a challenge because for the Northern Hemisphere instruments like the EVN or the VLBA, uh, it is difficult to have long integration and even long baselines because when the source uh, basically is high, um, for example, in Europe, then it is uh, uh, very low in East Asia or in the US. So it's really hard to get uh, uh, high elevation, uh, good calibrations and long baselines uh, mm, for this uh, uh, low declination. But on the other hand, there is the great possibility to observe this source both from the Northern and the Southern hemisphere. And so we're going to have uh, uh, good North-South baselines between East Asia and Australia and between uh, Europe and South Africa. So this was really a fantastic um, uh, observation that took place on the 12th of March in 2018, so 207 days after the um, gravitational wave detection. 32 radio telescopes uh, were involved uh, over the five con continents, uh, and again, uh, um, both in the northern and the southern hemisphere. The longest baseline was nearly 12,000 kilometers uh, between South Africa and the US. Uh, and uh, the other um, important point was sensitivity and uh, this was provided by the presence of very large uh, um, dishes uh, like Tiama, Effesberg, and Green Bank, uh, and also the use of the ATCA interferometer. All these efforts uh, um, resulted in a very low noise level, eight microjansky per beam, and uh, a, beam, a, a beam size of 3.5 times 1.5 milliarc seconds, which was really the key, uh, the key to solving the puzzle uh, posed by the other observations before. And I would like to point out that these results are presented in this uh, work by Giancarlo Ghirlanda and collaborators. And I really want to, to thank uh, all the people involved in that work for uh, the really great efforts that they made uh, on, on the many aspects that uh, were required for the interpretation of this uh, unique event.
So coming to the real um, results, uh, actually before coming to the real results, uh, um, to the method that we developed uh, before to, to interpret the, the results. So the idea was to uh, basically produce models of the possible scenarios uh, um, at work in this event. And so you see here the structured jet and the um, cocoon uh, heated by the choke jet. And for the cocoon, different opening angles were considered, an opening angle of 30 degrees, 45, and 60 degrees. And then these models were convolved with the beam. And again, the important thing is to highlight how this truly global experiment allowed to obtain a beam that was smaller, both in east-west and above all in north-south direction, compared to traditional um, or more standard, let's say, VLBI uh, beams. The final bit, of course, is to add noise to the simulated uh, um, images, and then finally to go and compare the results uh, for, of the observation to the uh, possible models. And what you see here is uh, four panels in which one, the, the top left, uh, shows the real image, the actual image, and the other three show uh, the simulated images. In one case, uh, using the successful jet, so the full relativistic jet, and the other two showing the uh, cocoon with different uh, opening angles. In all cases, the noise is, uh, is added. And just at first sight, it is uh, clear that the successful jet is the one that matches better the, um, the detection of the source. Uh, I, I need to point out that this is not a super, um, super bright uh, source. And again, without the very sensitive uh, eight microjansky uh, image that we produced, it would have not be possible not only to detect the source, but even more to discriminate about uh, among the models. Uh, what were the tests that we carried out to uh, demonstrate that uh, the successful jet was really the, the right uh, uh, interpretation of the emission. Uh, the first is uh, the combination of the size and the total flux density. So to give a few numbers about the result of the observation, uh, you remember the sensitivity was about eight microjansky and the image peak in our um, data was 42 microjansky. So this is more than a five sigma um, detection, which is also consistent uh, with the uh, measurements done uh, near time by the VLA and at the same time with Emerlin. Um, this provides an important uh, information that is that there is no uh, significant emission on scales uh, more extended than those probed by the VLBI. So no missing extended emission. And then uh, by uh, analyzing the visibility data and the image data, we obtained uh, a constraint of 2.5 million seconds at 90% confidence level for the structure. But uh, mm, this is not enough. We need to combine the information on the total flux density and the size. And so basically what was done here was to uh, see how many times in simulated images we would be able to reproduce an image that would have the same uh, size that we observe and also the same uh, total flux density. And basically what you see in this panel, in this panel is that only the successful jet is uh, able to uh, match the mm, the observed characteristics, while the other cases are at, at best marginally consistent in the case of a cocoon seen under a 30 degree, with a 30 degree opening angle and totally impossible for wider opening angles. So um, this first result uh, um, combined with the modeling of the light curve suggested that uh, a narrow jet uh, with an opening angle of just a few degrees, uh, 3.4 plus or minus one, and an energetic that uh, if seen on axis would be consistent with the typical shock gamma ray burst uh, are the correct interpretation of this, uh, of this uh, mm, source. And the viewing angle should be something around 15 degrees, which is still uh, um, small enough to see the radio emission, but not uh, as small as in the typical on axis case uh, observed in other gamma ray bursts. The other fundamental test uh, about uh, the um, presence of a relativistic jet in the system is the presence of motion. So um, while our result uh, basically allowed to um, provide evidence for the successful jet based on a single epoch, 
if we had the chance to observe the source in more epochs, then it would be possible also to study the displacement of the components and see if this is consistent with the motion, and in particular, if this motion uh, has some constraints on the viewing angle and on the intrinsic velocity. So this was done combining our data with two other observations uh, um, that use the high sensitivity array. These are presented in this paper by Mulley and collaborators. And the paper by Mulley by itself already shows that uh, there is a significant significant displacement between the two components. So the black contours here show the um, position on day 75, and the red uh, dashed contours show the position on day 230. So uh, without the possibility to constrain the, the, the size to the levels that were required um, by our simulation, this is, however, a very important uh, result that shows that uh, there is an apparent motion and that this apparent motion uh, is uh, larger than the speed of light. But uh, what is important is that very often with just two epochs, uh, one sees the motion, then, then uh, with the a third uh, point uh, becomes uh, um, confused uh, or, uh, or not confirmed. In our case, we had an intermediate epoch. Our observation was taken 270 days. And if you look at the numbers here or at the position here, one can really see that it fits perfectly. And so it gives a very strong support to the scenario of a superluminal apparent motion. Uh, and again, this is perfectly um, in agreement with an opening angle that is of a few degrees. So a fully developed collimated jet seen under a viewing angle of 14, 15 degrees. Okay, I think this uh, uh, is the conclusion of the, um, of the resolution of this puzzle uh, posed by 1708-17. Indeed, uh, the neutron star neutron star merger that was observed for the first time uh, was able to produce a relativistic jet. In this, uh, in this demonstration, the VLBI observation uh, provide the information on the open angle, which is narrow, that mm, the presence of a transverse velocity structure and the viewing angle. And this is all based on the size and the motion, which are really uh, specific uh, results that only VLBI could deliver. Um, of course, this is a single event, so it's not uh, easy to infer more general properties and we look forward to more events, but at least based on this result and on the, uh, on the numbers of uh, event in gravitational waves, uh, we can expect that at least 10% of the mergers of neutral star should be able to produce a relativistic jets. And then depending on the viewing angle, uh, we would observe an on uh, uh, GRB, an off GRB, or no uh, gamma ray emission. And the last bit here is again the stress that uh, for this particular event, uh, um, the entire power of the global LBI uh, was really key to obtaining the, um, the results. So what's next? Uh, um, I'm not going to say much more, but at least uh, uh, a couple of slides uh, um, can be devoted to what happened afterwards and what will happen in the, in the next years. Um, LIGO and Virgo operate in observing runs, which are called uh, O1, O2, and so on. So O1 and O2 were the first uh, uh, runs. O1 was the, uh, the first run in which uh, the, um, the first detection was, uh, um, was obtained, and O2 was the one in which uh, the first uh, neutron star merger was observed, the one that I've been talking about. These were followed by a third run uh, that um, started in April 2019 and finished uh, last year in March, uh, a little before the scheduled end due to the COVID pandemic. Uh, there, I have to say that there were very big expectations uh, to detect uh, and follow up uh, more binary neutron star events uh, similar to 1708-17, but that, uh, um, that was not really the case, uh, and not because the um, detectors didn't uh, operate well. In fact, uh, as I'm going to show in the next slide, they detected a lot of other events, but none of these events was uh, uh, suitable for a follow-up with, uh, um, with the LBI, or in general with uh, uh, electromagnetic facilities. Uh, I think this is opening uh, a problem that uh, VLBI uh, observatories should uh, keep in mind and take uh, as a driver for the next years. 
The idea is that with more detectors, uh, and we know that CAGRA is also going to join observations in the next cycle in 04, uh, will reveal more and more objects. Uh, but uh, in some cases, this will be fainter objects uh, at a small distance. In other cases, they will be uh, more distant objects. Uh, and if you keep in mind uh, the, the struggle that it was for us to look uh, for a 40 megaparsec distance event, uh, you can think how difficult it would be to go to much uh, uh, larger distances. On the other hand, there is a uh, hope in the sense that with uh, improved uh, mm, numbers of uh, interferometers, of GW interferometers and uh, improved characteristics, uh, we can expect also a refined localization. And so um, there should be other events uh, like the one, uh, the 1708 one with a relatively narrow um, localization area that allows for a detection of the, the follow-up. So just uh, a few statistics uh, about uh, O3. As I said, O3 ended uh, in 2020, and the data for the first six months have already been published. And you see here the collection of all the um, events uh, detected uh, in the first uh, um, observing runs. You see basically the various mergers uh, from with the progenitors and the resulting mass uh, for black hole, black hole pairs, uh, neutron star, neutron star pairs, and also there is uh, a neutron star black hole pair uh, here. There are a few uh, more um, outstanding events among these uh, 39 uh, events seen in the first uh, semesters, and they're really expanding the parameter space in terms of uh, mass and also of the mass ratio of the, of the progenitors. As I said, unfortunately, there was no possibility to follow up this with uh, um, BLBI or even other, other instruments. And so we really look forward to the future, uh, more uh, challenges, uh, more puzzles, uh, but also the possibility to resolve these puzzles with the, the high angular resolution provided by VLBI. And I mean, uh, as I mentioned, more um, binary neutral star jets, uh, because with only one, um, one event, uh, we can really say, uh, few on the general population uh, of events. Of course, we look forward to detecting uh, and resolving uh, with the uh, VLBI also the first jet produced by a black hole neutron star pair, if such jet can be formed. And another important bit that I would like to mention is the uh, detection of polarization, uh, possibly uh, again resolved in order to have information on the structure of the, of the jet itself. And by showing again the, the EVN and uh, the partners that will be um, operating with the EVN in the coming decades, I think uh, uh, I'm going to finish my presentation and thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much indeed, um, Marcello. Um, I don't see any questions yet in the question and answer. So please, if you've got some questions for Marcello, um, type them in there. But I, I have a couple of questions for you, if I could start things off. Um, I was intrigued by your, the image of um, GW170817. And it looked like it was, uh, yeah, that's right. Um, it looked like it, it looks like if it's moving towards the, the left hand side, like, could that be like a brightening at the edge of the jet or, or maybe material a plasma actually trailing behind something that's moving? I mean, do you think that structure is real? Uh, that's, a, <laughs> that's a very good question. Uh, let me say um, a few details on this image uh, on which I was very, very quick before. Um, as I said, this is an 8 Jansky image and the contours are traced at three and five sigma here. So this is the peak. And as you correctly guessed, the jet is moving from uh, the west to the east. So this is the position of the first uh, HSA epoch by Mooley and collaborators. And this is the second epoch uh, from HSA at 230 days. And this is the peak that we, that we measure. So uh, they match uh, mm, very well. So this gives uh, really confidence uh, to the model, but also to the astrometry, the astrometric registration and to the significance of the detection. Beyond this, uh, um, even more considering the size of the beam, it's really, it's really hard to make, um, to make conclusions. So I'm also tempted to, to see 
uh, a transverse structure here, and also a sort of uh, mm, trailing emission uh, from the, the direction from which the jet uh, um, comes. But it's really such a, a low significant feature and uh, um, a non-Gaussian noise because you see all the patterns of the interferometer that it's really hard to make any strong statement about the, the significance of such structure. Okay, but presumably this, um, this makes an argument that it could be quite useful to try to get more than images at more than one, one epoch, even to see if features like that are persistent. Is that true? That's, that's certainly true, except that uh, um, since this, uh, this is a transient event uh, and it's not con doesn't have a continuous injection of, uh, uh, of mm -hmm. particles, basically this is uh, uh, doomed for uh, vanishing in very, in very short time. So I don't expect that this can be seen as a persistent feature. Uh, what would be necessary would be uh, possibly a brighter event or an even deeper image that can uh, be um, subject to statistical tests uh, as the one that we made to discriminate between the uh, relativistic jet and the cocoon, uh, possibly trying to address also the, the, stru the transverse structure. Yeah, and this, this actually leads to another question which has, has come in from um, one of the viewers. <clears throat> and it was something I was thinking about as well in terms of what really is a good definition for a jet in this situation? Um, because it, uh, one of the, the questions that came in says, if this really is a, a jet, then the size um, really in both directions is not very much bigger than um, the size of the beam, especially in the transverse direction. So has anybody actually thought, what is a reasonable definition for um, a jet in this context? Uh, um... I would say that this is a question that uh, uh, has been um, considered uh, many times in, in the literature, but uh, has not reached uh, um, a consensus uh, and uh, um, a well-developed formal definition. Uh, for sure, the opening angle is, uh, is an important parameter. And, and what you see in this, in this cartoon from the, the earlier paper where the cocoon uh, interpretation was uh, preferred based on this early light curve um, is, a, uh, is a, in a pictorial way, the difference between a narrow, uh, so a few degree opening angle jet and a much uh, uh, broader um, structure that is the cocoon that in this case is uh, heated by a jet that is not able to pierce through. So I think basically the opening angle is uh, the, the main parameter, but coming back to the issue of the VLBI image, it's not uh, um, the VLBI image by itself uh, that can um, provide information on the opening angle. What the VLBI image provides is the constraint on the size, and then the constraint on the size combined with the modeling of the light curve is what gives uh, the information on the opening angle of the jet and the viewing angle. So it's a combination of the information taken from the image, but not by the image itself, and the light curve, but not the light curve by itself. Okay, thanks very much. And uh, the person who put in that last question just wanted to clarify, he, didn't, he wasn't trying to put any doubt on the definition of a jet, um, but what, what you really see emitting is the blast wave that the, the, this outflow cause, causes when it collides with the ISM. Um, but the angular structure of the blast wave has a direct relationship with the, the jet outflow that caused it. Um, we've got another question here. Let me just take this up. Um, okay, somebody is worried they may have under, misunderstood a couple of things. Um, why do only 10% of BNSs, um, why do you expect only 10% of the uh, BNS systems to, to do the same sort of thing as GW170817? Is it because of the geometry orientation of the jets um, and a technical reason or some intrinsic physics involved with the, those systems? Um, this is mostly based uh, on the comparison of the numbers uh, of gamma ray bars uh, based on the luminosity function and uh, the numbers of binary neutron stars uh, 
uh, estimated from uh, what is observed uh, by the initial runs uh, from uh, uh, LIGO Virgo. So this is a really uh, rather uncertain number. Mm, it's probably a, a lower limit, lower uh, estimate, this 10%, it could be more, um, but it's really the number of uh, neutron star mergers that can produce a jet. Then whether this jet can be observed uh, depends on the viewing angle. So whether we can actually see the associated gamma ray burst uh, is a, a, a smaller fraction of this number that is, however, larger than 10%. Okay, thank you. And another question, um, you showed evidence that this, this system had a jet well, earlier observations somewhat favored the cocoon jet interaction scenario. Um, are the two results actually unreconcilable or could it be that one evolved into the other? It could have been that one evolved into the other. That's, um, that, that's certainly a possibility. The, the thing is that uh, the, the radio light curve, and I think I had a slide somewhere. Okay, so the, the, the radio light curve uh, can be interpreted with, the, um, can, can be broadly consistent, let's say, with the, uh, various uh, parameters, uh, uh, various sets of parameters uh, based on various, uh, uh, on various models. And it's really the, um, the detection of the uh, compactness and the size uh, that uh, uh, demonstrate the presence of the jet. But of course, those uh, uh, refer to the, the late emission. So this gentle rise at the beginning uh, is, uh, mm, is consistent with being dominated by the cocoon. So uh, the cocoon is not ruled out, uh, the, the existence of the cocoon is not ruled out, but this feature here can only be accounted for by a fully relativistic jet. Okay, thank you. And um, another question, um, can you just say a, a tiny bit about the, the process that is used to actually identify, um, say, a galaxy where one of these events might have occurred um, from the original uh, gravitational wave positions? Um, you know, is there some approach that's used, for example, trying to reduce the volume and redshift and then look at what galaxies are there? Or is it just like usually a blind search that's used? Okay, um, well, it, it really uh, depends uh, on, on the nature of the event and uh, uh, whether an electromagnetic counterpart is detected and on the size of the initial uh, detection. So there are a lot of um, instruments uh, that uh, um, have um, time allocated for the follow-up of the gravitational wave events. And of course, uh, each instrument, uh, depending on its uh, uh, frequency uh, range, uh, um, can target different, type, uh, uh, different types of events. So in the case of uh, hard X-rays, soft gamma rays, uh, so the search of uh, the gamma ray burst, uh, basically this is uh, just based on uh, um, all-sky monitors and the temporal uh, identification of uh, gamma ray burst with uh, um, a gravitational wave event. For other instruments that have a narrower field of view, they have to uh, exploit, uh, um, uh, how to say, um, it's again a compromise between uh, uh, having a wide field of view instrument that can survey as much, uh, uh, as wide uh, an area of the sky as possible, and then a narrow field instrument that can do the follow-up and confirm any possible, um, any possible event. So in this process, it is, very, it is quite common that uh, uh, interesting transients uh, are discovered, for example, in the optical, but then it's a matter of following them up uh, with other instruments uh, and see if these transients uh, are really related to the, um, to the type of event, to the gravitational wave event, uh, or rather they are just uh, random transients that uh, uh, by chance occur in the same, the same region. So it's really um, uh, a process that involves uh, several steps uh, and very large collaborations. Uh, and in fact, uh, these are all uh, papers that result in thousands of uh, uh, authors because it's really a, a massive effort from the community across the, across the spectrum. Okay, thank you. Um, and we've got a question that has come in from somebody watching on YouTube. Um, do you think there's a possibility of discovering electromagnetic signatures 
from a black hole neutron star merger? Yes, um, that, that's really the next, uh, uh, the next goal. Uh, so um, it depends uh, uh, in part of the, on, the, um, on the mass ratio and on the fraction of, uh, uh, mm, of gas that would be, well, of matter that would be um, accreted and then ejected in the form of a jet. But uh, the possibility is certainly there and we look forward to a suitable event to, to follow up. Okay, and um, a, a direct follow-up um, from that question. Um, do you know of any estimates of the number of such sources in the near, near universe? How hard is it gonna to be to find? Yeah, uh, there are uh, um, a lot of estimates uh, that are continuously updated based on the, uh, the latest results. So the, the numbers are really um, subject to larger, like uh, order of magnitudes uh, uncertainty, but we expect uh, that about one event uh, per year could be um, detectable with the uh, VLBI. Well, that's, that's actually, it gives you something to go on, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. Okay, I think um, that does it for our questions. We don't have any more questions coming in. So I'd like to thank um, Marcello again for a very interesting and engaging talk. And um, we'll let Benito give some briefly some information about some upcoming seminars. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcello. So don't go quite yet, folks, because we've got an announcement to make. Here we go. Um, so we have two more seminars coming up in the near future in the series. Um, the next one will be given on 9th of June by Piki Atri on VLBI observations of compact stellar systems. And there'll be a, a talk as well by Ivan Marti Vidal on Friday, 2nd of July on VLBI astrometry. And all of that will be leading up to the um, EVN European VLBI Network Mini Symposium and Users Meeting, which will be happening on July 12th to 14th, 2021 this year. Um, and uh, the website is given there. Um, we now have uh, all the, the talk abstracts that and poster abstracts um, submitted. And so we expect to be publishing a um, provisional program soon. And um, if you haven't registered yet, there's still time and the registration will remain open up until the time of the mini symposium. So take a look at the website um, and uh, we hope to see many of you at the next two seminars and also at the EVN mini symposium and users meeting. Okay, bye-bye for now folks. <laughs>